Okay. So, sir, uh, sir, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes, Shukalpa. Yes, sir. When you are applying the periodic boundary condition in the lattice, does it sufficiently tell that the wave function will also be periodic? The wave that function is, is periodic with. Uh, let me restart this, and then I'll answer your question. Um, Uh, sir, um, can you record on the iPad as well? Because then it will not sleep, uh, go to sleep. Then uh, I think. Oh, uh, maybe next time I'll try that because right now, uh, you know, it's not the. I started the meeting off from my iMac, so I have to give permission to that and so on. Okay. Uh, so let me try to answer. Uh, uh, you call first question. So you are asking whether the wave function is periodic when we are on a lattice. Is that your question? Yes. I mean, we are imposing the boundary condition on the lattice. I mean, that is sufficiently tell that the wave function will also be periodic. Firstly, here we don't have a lattice. Okay. The electrons are moving in continuum space. There is no lattice. There is no potential. The potential is zero inside the box. Number one. We'll come to lattice in the uh, you know after we finish this then uh, when we are on a lattice the wave function does not have the periodicity of the lattice no electronic wave functions do not have the periodicity of the lattice but when i'm imposing a periodic boundary condition then as i wrote here um, psi r plus um, let's say l along the x direction is the same as I have deleted it, uh, is the same as uh, uh, the wave fun value of the wave function at x. Um, that same thing would apply there also. But the wave function will not have the periodicity of the lattice. Sir, I have a question on, yes. on this. Uh, sir, so if we take uh, the periodic boundary condition, uh, then uh, and uh, compare it with suppose we have a box of length L and then we tend L to infinite like box normalization, then in the second case, there are certain low frequency wave functions that are allowed, whereas in the periodic boundary case, the lowest frequency is just repeated. So it is kind of a high frequency thing for the whole lattice. So, uh, um, when you, sorry, when you take open boundary conditions, open meaning, I mean, where does your wave function vanish? You have to be clear about that. Uh, actually, I was saying that uh, since in both of the cases, we are trying to model uh, an infinite uh, box kind of a thing. Uh, means the lengths are tending to infinite in both the cases. So in one of the cases, uh, we are saying that there is a small one and this small thing is being repeated over and over. Whereas the other thing, uh, another one in box normalization kind of a case, I think we are saying that the L tends, we are tending L to infinity. So the, for example, the mode N equal to one, that is only uh, one sine wave from zero to two pi. That thing is present in box normalization, but that thing is not present in uh, periodic boundary condition because uh, that uh, 0 to 2 pi is being repeated. So it's many uh, full cycles. So only one full cycle is not there. If I understand your uh, question and argument correctly, let me sort of uh, answer it the following way that there are two, there are three possibilities that I talked about. One is that the periodic boundary condition, what we are doing now, Okay, uh, yeah. even here, whether I mean, what L is does matter. Uh, uh, it matters in the sense that what how many K values you get is determined by what L is. Even if, when you do not apply periodic boundary conditions, there are two possibilities. One is that you uh, you uh, claim that the wave functions vanish at the boundary. That's the first sort of one-dimensional problem you solve when you start learning quantum mechanics. 
So this is just a three dimensional version of that. If you apply that kind of boundary condition, then you get stationary sort of solutions, right? Yes. The wave functions, the wave function uh, or all wave functions have to vanish in the boundaries. Uh, on the other hand, the other possibility I talked about while doing open boundary conditions is that you say that I have a box of size L, but my wave functions really vanish only as X goes to infinity or minus infinity and so on for Y and Z. So these two situations are different. Uh, yes. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay, so that's uh, yeah. That's the number of that's the number of k points in a volume omega in the k space. So the density of k points in the k space that is the number of k points per unit volume of k space. just be this divided by omega so this is p over a phi q okay uh, so then what we want to do of course we want to calculate the ground state energy of this system so first we are interested in the ground state ground state meaning t equal to zero all right so we want to calculate the energy and let's see what else we can calculate uh, so I'll erase this. So in order to calculate the energy, so one important thing is that we are dealing with fermions. So therefore, we have to uh, keep track of the fact that uh, electrons are spin up fermions. So we can put at the most only two electrons in each k space. So the one electron levels are specified by two indices. K and S Z and K is this three dimensional vectors K X, K Y, K Z and we just saw what you know, the values can be and this can be of course uh, plus or minus half the ideal values. So therefore, um, uh, how do we fill this? Of course, we start filling with the lowest energy state, which is, and what, what is the sort? The other thing, of course, I, mean, I forgot to write, but you already know. So given the Hamiltonian, the free particle Hamiltonian that we wrote, uh, if we have a state uh, given by the uh, index k, the energy of that state just this okay so uh, the lowest energy state would of course be for k equal to zero so we start by filling on k equal to zero state then x state and, and so on uh, as we go along and also this uh, thing tells you that if i want to have the lowest energy state uh, you know when i have very many electrons this would pretty much be a sphere. Okay. Uh, so when the system is very, very large, when L is very large, the number of electrons are very large, uh, the field portion of the A space would essentially be a sphere. So this discreteness of the, of the K points near the boundaries uh, will not be significant. So, um, yeah, so that is the, that is the argument. So what will be that, uh, so suppose for a certain number of electrons, so this is the number of electrons, uh, is the volume of the metal. And 
what else? That's all we have. And suppose this is the sphere in P space. You have to sort of imagine it to be a sphere. And so things will be filled up to some wave vector Kf. Uh, so the volume of that region in K space is of course is Q. Uh, so uh, so that's the volume, and then I know the density of these points in the K space. So given this volume, I can figure out how many K points there are inside that. So that would so the number of k points in that sphere, that sphere meaning this sphere, which is occupied by electrons in the ground state. So when we are saying ground state, we mean that temperature is zero, so that things are in the lowest energy state. So that would be the volume in a whole third is cute and then uh, multiplied by that density of k points and so this will be the root x times c Okay, so this is the what is this? This is the number of k points inside this sphere, and electrons again being spin half fermions. You can put two of them in each of these uh, states. So the total number of electrons that you can put in these many k points, so then that has to be equal to n, the total number of electrons that is equal to. Twice this, so so this implies n, which is the number density of electrons. This is a quantity we dealt with when we were doing the theory also. So this is. Related to uh, there's a pi square over there, right? Yes. This. So this is a very very important relation, uh, <laughs> as we'll realize. So basically, the the so this sphere. Okay. So let me now uh, just. Give you the terms for this, which you are already familiar with, I believe. So, this sphere, which is in the case space, which is occupied by electrons at t equal to zero, is called the Fermi sphere. So, everything is Fermi, right? So, this is the Fermi sphere, and this surface in the case space, which separates the occupied and the unoccupied states, is the Fermi surface. The corresponding wave vector Kf, the radius of the Fermi sphere, is the Fermi wave vector. The corresponding velocity, so the velocity of the electrons that are at the highest occupied energy level, is the Fermi velocity. So the Fermi velocity is h cross Kf by n. Fermi momentum is this, this is Kf, and this is the, the energy of the highest occupied state is the Fermi. Standard definitions, you also know that. Uh, so, what I'm focusing on is this. So in the ground state, the only parameter or only thing that varies from one vector to another is this n, the electron number density, and that determines everything, all properties of the system, the ground state properties. Right. Uh, 
So uh, what is important is to sort of have a feel for some numbers. And I've been repeatedly telling you, it's important to have a feel for some of these quantities, or uh, you know, numerical values for typical methods. So let us first look at uh, the Fermi velocity, all right? So Fermi velocity. In and how, what is K? Oh, before that, yeah, we have to talk about K because that's, uh, that's uh, important. That comes in everywhere, uh, Fermi velocity, Fermi energy, and it is related to the electron density. So, uh, yeah, so which one do I use here? Um, yeah. Yeah, so how did we define um, RS? So RS was defined as um, so this one over n, which is the volume per electron, was defined as uh, sir, your uh, iPad. Ah, yes. Yes, so this is how uh, we define the quantity Rs and we have some feel for our numbers for the quantity Rs. So now if you use this, uh, then um, and from here you find that if u is square n. So using these two, you can relate Kf to Rs, which is straightforward. Uh, if would be inversely related to RS. And it turns out that if you just follow it through, uh, you find that if is 1.212 divided by RS. You just put in the numerical values and this is what you get. And uh, sometimes it's written in the following way that if you divide both numerator and denominator by the four radius and so this gives you three point something in the numerator um, it's 3.63 Right in the Anstrom, uh, the unit will turn out to be Anstrom inverse uh, because this is the inverse of origin. Now, what were the typical values of RS over A naught? Yes, Monojit, what is what were the typical values of RS over A naught that we saw? Between two and three. Mm, two and Yes, what was it? Two and? Uh, two and three. I mean, RS is typically a uh, few angstrom, I mean, 1.5 angstrom, and A naught is 0.53 angstrom, so it's two or three. Not uh, two at the lower end is fine, but I think the upper end is not three. If you look at the alkali, uh, alkali atoms, alkali metals, then it goes up to five between five and six. So two to six is the sort of realistic range of RS over A naught. Okay. Um, so that is scale. Okay. So what were we, yeah, we were trying to estimate this. So now what do you have to do? is to put in values of H cross and N, the electron mass, and Kf you estimate from this. This is the number of uh, 
of the same order as this. So something like one. And when you plug in these values, and this I will leave for you to figure out, what you have is, um, so this will be something like four point something divided by the RSO value naught times e to the cubed centimeters per second. So compare this with the velocity we got uh, in the Jude model when we distributed this electron velocity from you know, the, the room temperature. So what, what value did we use there? So what was it for room temperature when we wrote? So what did we get? Around ten ratio five centimeter per second. Ashish, can you uh, say it once again? Ten raised to five centimeter per second. No, 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 no. Take to the power five. I'll give you a. I'll give you a minute. You just, you know, look up these values, plug them in, and then tell me the order of magnitude for this. So basically, you have to see what the electron mass is, uh, what kb is. Uh, just open the internet if you don't remember the values. Find out the values, plug them in, and tell me what that V would be at room temperature. Uh, 10 to the power 5 meter per second. 10 to the power 5 meters per second. Oh, OK. Yeah. Maybe uh, she didn't tell the unit. Yes. If you write in meters per second, yes, 10 to the power 5 meters per second is 10 to the 7 centimeters per second of that order, um, which is, as we see here, is not quite correct uh, when you use the quantum model. So this. Fermi velocity, which is, you know, these are the electrons which will take part in most of the physical uh, processes before any of the ones deep inside do so. And the typical velocity for them is 10 to the 8 centimeters per second. So this was this one of the sort of mistakes in today's estimation which accidentally led to the correct number for kappa over sigma. All right, so that is the Fermi velocity. And so as you see, it is you know, 10 to the eight centimeters per second. And the next thing we want to estimate is, let's say um, the Fermi energy, okay? Uh, so one more thing, uh, if you keep like, uh, if you long touch this camera screen, it will be focused. If I don't do what? Uh, long, uh, just long touch this ca uh, camera screen. Uh, you mean my uh, iPad camera, iPad screen, just long touch anywhere uh, when camera is on. Okay. So it will be focused. Okay, let's see if it works. Uh, I have to share it again, right? Um, yeah. 
So um, epsilon n, we want to get as as this. this. So that's, uh, so I'll just indicate one way of, so uh, the sort of conventional way of writing this is this is, uh, there's a two here. Uh, this is written in a way uh, this way because if you uh, can identify this, this is just a naught. So um, so uh, this is written as a naught over uh, sorry e square. I'm, I'm just indicating this because uh, you know this is just this is already give you a, 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 an idea on the order of this. So this is just the if this is a half a heart tree. If you remember your solution of the hydrogen atom problem, um, so this is the energy of uh, basically uh, the one state. So this is the rework unit of energy and these are both you know of the same order so so this is so it's it's of the order of you know uh, electronic energies in atoms which are um, quite large in fact if you think about it so let us uh, uh, look at some more concrete numbers so then what you have to do again is uh, just the standard thing you take this Expression and h cross square by point c. I have this EF, and for k, if I use one of these, so I can write this as and I have to plug in that using appropriate units. So when I do that, um, you'll get something like uh, something close to 15 square in um, this is in yeah. so again what is rs over a naught rs over a naught is something like 6 and uh, this is 50 so, uh, if, um, so if I, for example, take it to be something like five uh, for one of the uh, metallic systems, then this is 25, so I get a factor of two. So in fact, uh, typically the, the Fermi energies turn out to be, or if this is smaller, they, they show be larger, and if, Turns out to be about uh, something like between a and fifteen. Like that. Yeah. So this is the typical energy scale. And so, what is uh, good to have a feel for is that if I think of this as you know, if I ask what is the equivalent temperature, so basically I'm asking what is Kf so that Kgtf is equal to my thermal energy. So, uh, so basically, then Kf is thermal energy was this. And again, if you plug in the values, you'll get um, 58 point something divided by 
square times uh, 10 to the 4 Kelvin. So I'm sorry, it's kind of becoming a little messy here, but it's 58.2 by RS over N of square times 10 to the 4 Kelvin. So if this I take to be something you know, between 1, 2 of that order, so it is 10 to the 4 Kelvin. So it's a very high temperature. And this is why, uh, basically, at room temperature, the electrons are really, I mean, uh, at low temperature. Yeah. All right. Um, so now, that we have calculated things. Let us try to calculate the ground state energy of the electrons. So, um, how do I calculate the ground state energy? Uh, sir, you're right. Oh, see, it's not it's not working. So this is basically what I have to do. I have to sum over all the energy states um, which are occupied for Ks below Kf. And this factor of two is because of speed. So this is and in order to do that, we just generally look at the the, the in the general function h of k, because we have to do such things, these are vectors. So suppose I have to evaluate something like this. If is any function of k, so I what I do is I, I can write this as. Uh, Where uh, you know, I, I I take this small volume delta k in the k space, and uh, so this may not be even less than k. This can be any general uh, sum over k. So this is a, this is a small volume in k space, and the number of k points there would be this times this, and then uh, so this sum is the same as that. Sum. And then in the limit that volume in the real space that is V goes to infinity and I take very small volumes in the K space so that delta K goes to zero. Uh, this sum is essentially the integral over K of this function. So in this is I have this uh, the 3D integral over k space, provided that this function is smooth over uh, the volume delta k. Okay, so then uh, look at this was my left hand side, so I can write one over p.
So I can I can replace such summations over uh, uh, over the P space by such integrals. So this divided by B is one over a pi cubed. This integral. So this is what we use uh, while evaluating the, uh, the energy of the electron, the ground state energy of the electron system. So there is a one over B here. So I want to evaluate E over B, which is And this case, of course, will be uh, summing over the energy. So there is a, a factor of two because of speed. This is what we have to evaluate. Okay. And if you do the integral, which is absolutely this is for the list of 10 by square. 10 So this is what we get. One is often interested in the in, in energy per unit uh, energy per electron rather than energy per unit volume. So I'm, I want to evaluate this. So this is simply my uh, one of them. Right inverse number density and that has a relation to AF. So this integral would be from zero to AF at zero temperature. So here basically what you do is uh, you know this. So this is evaluated like here and there is a relation between uh, one over N and KF. You use that and so using that you get so this is something you probably had evaluated earlier right uh, so the interesting thing is that although we will not get into that discussion in this course, but uh, even when you treat a model of electrons by including electron electron interactions, the, uh, the kinetic energy of the electrons turn out, turns out to be exactly this. So that's just a comment. Right, then um, what else can you calculate? You can calculate pressure of the electrons. So you know the energy. So, and as you see, energy is uh, dependent on Kf, which depends on N. So, it should depend on the density. So, therefore, if you change the volume of the system, keeping the number of electrons fixed, uh, your in a, uh, uh, your energy should change. So therefore, what we can calculate is that is just the pressure. So pressure of this electron gas system, if you wish. So minus daily del B for a constant uh, number of electrons. And uh, so what is it? So E is as we calculated E by so This is the total energy of any electron system. This was energy per electron. So this is the total energy of any electron system. And uh, so what we want to have is its derivative with respect to V. And the only thing that depends on V here is epsilon F uh, through Kf. 
So, uh, so what was it? So, I can find it. Same, right? And uh, if how does K if depends on uh, depend on uh, depend on uh, the volume? All right. So uh, so what we had found was that N, which is N over V, is some constant times k f cubed. So this goes as k f cubed. So uh, now k f square would then be v to the minus two thirds. So this whole thing goes as some constant times v to the minus two thirds. And that's all we need because we just want to calculate uh, the derivative with respect to g. So this is energy, so then e then b to the minus sign is uh, And so then uh, I can again bring in this, this constant is exactly this constant. So this can be written as and you can go ahead and calculate the bulk modulus also, uh, which would be minus V. Del P del V, right? And so again, these are straightforward uh, calculations. So I'll just leave it to you. And so you should be able to find that this becomes this yes. We'll look at some numbers as I Keep repeating that you know having a sense of these numbers or how uh, the theory is doing in terms of actual numbers compared to experiments is ultimately what determines uh, whether it's useful or not useful. So um, that's about the ground state properties of the electron gas system. So now we want to look at some of the uh, finite temperature properties of this system. And after that, we uh, look at the transport coefficients, etc., that we calculated in the context of do the theory. Okay, um, so when we want to calculate properties at finite temperatures, so what we have to bring in is that now, these are things you have already known. So uh, at zero temperature, everything up to K, all the states up to K was filled, and 
on the stage beyond K and not feel that is obviously not the case when you are at finite temperatures. So one has to bring in this Fermi uh, function probability that some state with energy epsilon is occupied is given by So that, that has to be brought in, otherwise uh, things are not very different. So then if I want to calculate the energy of the electron gas system at some finite temperature T, then uh, we have to do this sum. instead of just summing over k is up to k f and uh, by the same logic that we used earlier that of course does not change so this would be this so far We have to evaluate this integral in order to. Um, Sir, the iPad, I think. Um, huh. yeah. Yeah, so what I'm saying is that uh, we have to evaluate these kind of uh, integrals in order to calculate energy at finite temperatures. So let's see what we do here. Uh, yeah, so Suppose I have a general integral of the form and some function. So these are ultimately all functions of k because epsilon is also a function of k. So if I have an integral like this, so uh, uh, yeah, so what we'll do is, uh, so this was, so I'll, I'll write this as 4 pi k squared, so I, k squared, this was 4 pi cubed, 4 pi, so I'll get with pi squared, right, and And then what we do is we write, try to write everything in terms of epsilon. So this uh, I use epsilon and h squared k squared over one in right. So I will use this to write this k squared in terms of epsilon. So twice epsilon over h cross squared. That is one thing. And then we also will have d epsilon as h cross square over n k d k. Using this, I can replace that d k in terms of d epsilon. So if you do these exercise, you will eventually, um, so I'm not doing that algebra, which you can figure out. You will get this. And this is defined, by the way, 
these integrals at finite temperatures are now all the way from zero to infinity. In this case, it happens to be from zero to infinity, but um, I'll just write it as minus infinity to infinity. Uh, sir, please touch the iPad screen once. It's actually out of focus. That is kind of strange. Um, let's see how it does now. Is it better? Yes, it's fine now. Yeah, so uh, what I said was that in, in this integral, I just replace all the k's by epsilons using these two, and I end up getting this integral, which I write like this. So this is the definition of g of epsilon. So what is g of epsilon? Uh, so it is like the number of energy states that you have in the system per unit volume. Because I'm evaluating this. So, so why is the lower limit minus infinity? Yes, someone are you saying something? So why is the lower limit minus infinity? Yeah, I'll just uh, I'll just explain that in a minute. Uh, just hold on. Um, so I, I wrote that integral from minus infinity to infinity, and uh, so what are the definition of g of epsilon is now. Uh, just this this whole object, okay? In and for this particular system, this particular system may not be generally true. So this is g of epsilon for epsilon greater than zero, and it's zero for epsilon. So that's my definition of the function g epsilon, right? Then you would agree with this, right? Uh, so this g of epsilon, which is the number of energy states, number of allowed energy states per unit volume. So this per unit volume is important. So this is states. So this is a result you may be already familiar with. It's a very well known result that in three dimensions, the density of states of electrons uh, goes as epsilon to the power half and if you do the whole exercise in two dimensions um, So, uh, yeah, so what I was saying is that, so if you, uh, in 3D, it goes as epsilon to the power half. If you do the exercise in 2D, it will, go, it will become a constant. So, uh, some important quantities that show up in calculations, it will show up pretty soon, is The density of states at the Fermi energy. So all you do is you just plug epsilon f here. That's the density of states at the Fermi energy, and um, that's it. 
you can write it in terms of the density. It just happens to be, and this is something you just you can evaluate using all the relations between various quantities we have derived in and if and so on. That uh, this happens to be. I'll just give you the forms you can try to figure it out. It's rather straightforward. So this can be written as three by two n. Okay. Um, right. So we haven't yet calculated the energy. We started cal out by cal you know, calculating the energy. Then I then we sort of got di uh, diverted to this because I wanted to introduce the idea of density of states. So now that we understand the idea of density of states, let us now go back to the calculation of the energy or energy density that is energy by unit volume of the electronic system. Right, so what are we trying to calculate? We are trying to calculate energy per unit volume, which is So then, uh, from the discussion we just finished, And in order to evaluate this, we also need to look at this. So uh, from our previous discussion, you see that this is now this function capital S or this is, in this case, this is the function. Okay. Before proceeding further, I'll just state a result that that you need uh, to evaluate these things. Uh, which is discussed in the appendix in Ashcroft and Marvin's book. I will not get into the sort of mathematical discussion of it here. I'll just quote what the essential result is. If you are interested, you can go ahead and read it. So, uh, Okay, suppose you have to evaluate. So this is the Fermi function, by the way. The small f is the Fermi function. So if you have to evaluate integrals of um, of this form, you know, but this is infinity. Uh, then uh, provided that h of epsilon is not a very rapid so it varies uh, it doesn't vary very smoothly over an energy scale of kvt Now, again, let me uh, clarify here. So, this mu that goes into the Fermi distribution function is the chemical potential, which is not exactly the same as the Fermi energy 
zero temperature and Fermi energy that we talked about. There's a subtle difference between the two. And again, there is a very nice discussion of it. You may have already studied it in statistical mechanics. You can go back and check that. If not, there is a really nice physically transparent description given in chapter two of Ashcroft and Morgan. Uh, you can look that up as well. Basically, this is defined as the difference of the L world's free energies for an N plus one particle system and the N particle system. Uh, all right, so mu is the chemical potential. So, what one is claiming here is that if this function h epsilon um, doesn't vary too rapidly, is a smooth function in, uh, over an energy scale of kdt around the chemical potential, then such expansion, uh, such integrals can be written in the following, as the following expansion. Yes. So, if you can, if you, uh, I mean, you can maximize the time set for inactivity. Um, <laughs> I don't know why to do it. Uh, not yet. So, if you tell me, that will be useful, of course. I don't know how to use an iPad. Yeah, I don't know why uh, once, I mean, because my Zoom session is on and I'm sharing the screen, so I don't know why it should go off at all. Um, that is something I will have to figure out next time. Okay. Um, so the, the result is that, which I said, I won't get into the proof for the mathematical discussion of it, but if each of epsilon is smooth over an energy scale kdt around the around the uh, chemical potential then this integral can be written as is our constants So that's the result. Now, before using it, let us try to. Uh, how about we bring in time? What time is it? Okay, we have some 10 15 minutes. Uh, so, um, yeah, let us try to have some sense of the order of magnitude of this because you know what? Um, uh, what we are dealing with the functions uh, when we evaluate such integrals, uh, we are dealing with typically you know functions that have major variations only over length scales of mu, so they don't vary too much over the length scales of kvt, where kvt is, is let's say the room temperature. Okay. Also, basically, and also, so the functions. We have to deal with um, typically have these properties. The iPad. Why is it switching off so quickly? I don't understand. Once again, let me just. To the... uh, maybe you can go to the settings and then uh, go to display and brightness and there there is an auto lock option. I don't know whether it should work but you can check.
So we are dealing with functions that the derivatives are typically Yeah, small and I mean of this order and close to this. Okay, so if this is the case, then when I take one of these derivative terms, so the first term would be uh, uh, a two n minus one would be one, so the first derivative of h and of oh, It tells me you have stopped screen, screen sharing, which of course I haven't. Um, Um, so, okay, so let us look at one of these terms. So, when m is 1, uh, this is the first derivative I'm talking about. And, um, right, so this should be 2n, right? Some uh, some power I'm missing somewhere. I have to have another look at it. But basically, um, the quantities that I get, the successive terms, uh, the first term would be the ratio. So basically, what I'm trying to tell you is that this derivative will bring in mu in the denominator, and I have a kvt in the numerator. So things will go as you know, powers of, I have to take the uh, powers once again uh, carefully. Um, so the successive terms, so the first derivative and the third derivative term, so the third derivative term would be this much smaller than the first derivative. And there we have some sense of these numbers. So this is room temperature and the correspond, temperature corresponding to this, this mu would be um, what? What would be your answer? What would be the temperature scale? We want to make an estimate of what these numbers are typically, kvt over mu squared. So, uh, Someone, so Shukalpa, can you tell me what would be the order of magnitude of KBT over mu squared? So I will have to check. So what is the temperature scale you would guess should correspond to mu? The room temperature maybe. No, KBT is the, so we are uh, trying to evaluate things at the room temperature. So T is, let's say, the room, room temperature. 10 okay. to the power minus... Uh, Army temperature or, probably. Or KBT over mu. Yes, sorry? So for KBT over mu, it should be like 10 to the power minus 2. Uh, T by TF actually. Yeah, yeah, T by TF, exactly. Yeah. So that's the right ratio and we saw that uh, what was tf tf was 10 to the 4 room temperature is 10 to the 2 so the ratio is 10 to the 2 so i mean you get my point right so this is a really small number room temperature over fermi temperature is of the order of 10 to the 2 and square of that is uh, 10 to the minus 2 and square of that is 10 to the minus 4 the successive terms are really small so that we really need to uh, Take if we are at room temperature, the first term is a good approximation. Okay, 
So then, um, so that is the idea behind this. So then, if one actually plugs in this, the values of these constants and so on. Uh, so we'll now try to write the expressions for the energy and So what one gets is plus other terms. So uh, in these, in evaluating these two quantities, what differs is that the H uh, epsilon are different in these two cases. In this case, this is H In this case. And then that H prime term, so I uh, have to take the derivative of this and uh, take its value at epsilon equal to mu. Uh, sir, please touch on the screen for once. Uh -huh. uh, please touch on the screen. Uh, uh -huh. That's what I did. Okay, so uh, that would give me mu times. Uh, so, this I'm right. This is. Me. That is what I have uh, to the leading order. Now I uh, make a sort of small approximation, which is that I integrate this from zero to epsilon f, which is the Fermi energy. And the, the integral from epsilon to mu, that tiny bit is written as mu minus epsilon f times the value of this integrand at epsilon f. So which would be epsilon f. So this is a linear approximation uh, around epsilon f, if you wish, for the integral from epsilon f to mu. Plus, I have this term.
Right. So, um, what is this? This is just the energy, the ground state energy of the electron system, right? Because I'm integrating from minus infinity to epsilon f, epsilon g epsilon. So that's, that will just give me the ground state energy of the electron system. We have to evaluate these two terms now. In order to evaluate these two terms, we will look at this. Now I want you to uh, see and note down this last expression uh, because I cannot preserve it on the board because I have to do the other thing. Uh, but you know, once we work with that, it will tell us what the value of these two are. Uh, Okay, so now we uh, look at that in is um, and again we use the same uh, expression for this. So, yeah, right. So, If I do the same exercise, what I get is this is the sort of linear part of epsilon f to mu. Then derivative. Now what is this? I'm just integrating over the densities of states from uh, minus infinity to epsilon f, which is basically zero to f epsilon f in this case for this particular problem. So that will just give me the number of electrons per unit volume, which is the electron number density n. And I'm left with that. So therefore, this part has to be zero. These two terms should add up to zero. Uh, so, uh, so you equate that to zero, and that will give you Okay, so while I did I'll choose that. Right. Um, wait a second. So I'm just let me just see what exactly I want to tell you. Um, yeah, what I want to tell you is that uh, so if you just so basically if you uh, put this term equal to zero, what you get is mu as epsilon f So that just tells you how mu uh, varies from epsilon f, which is the Fermi energy at zero temperature. And then knowing what epsilon, I mean, you know the form for G for the electron gas problem. So therefore, uh, we can
we can write that. That's the expression I was trying to write earlier. But basically, uh, this is it. Okay. So, uh, and what you can do is you can take this new, plug it into the earlier expression that I wrote, and eventually you will get to lead the, the leading order thing, of course, will be. So here is here is mu. So you can take this mu and plug into the earlier equation. But the leading thing, so if so this mu has two two bases. One is epsilon f plus or minus a correction, which goes as t squared. So if we take terms only up to order k b t squared, if I neglect the higher order terms, which we are doing right now. So then the u that we are evaluating will get u for t equal to zero. The first piece that we have got plus this term that comes from this and the other t squared factors that we had, which we will get as uh, times. Now this is the. Uh, can anyone hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Yes, we can. Okay, because I got a strange message that I have been log logged out. So let me just quickly finish this, and then I'll I'll, I'll check that. So uh, I don't know. The screen looks very blurry to me. Can you read the screen at all? No, we got. Uh, no surprise. Uh, Huh. I think it is better. So this is what I'm uh, talking about. Uh, so uh, this is the expression for the energy that you get at finding temperature. So this piece was what we had calculated at t equal to zero plus this, which is dependent on t squared. So if you were to calculate specific heat or volume, you would calculate this, which will give you something that goes as t. So the temperature, so the uh, temperature dependence of the specific heat due to the electrons is linear in T. But when you actually measure uh, specific heat at room temperatures or higher temperatures, you get a value for metals I'm talking about, which rather looks like this. Not just a linear piece, but there is a T cube and a dominant T cube contribution, except if you are at very low temperatures. So obviously, this is not the full story. And just to remind you of the context, first drew it through a classical model and then Sommerfeld after the sort of formulation of the quantum mechanics, uh, tried to explain properties of metals just by modeling the electrons. And as this simple thing tells you that that doesn't seem to be the full story. So one has to look for something else also. So I also wanted to look at some numbers uh, for you know, how they change when you go from the two to three sort of theory. So I think we are running out of time today. Um, so this is something I'll uh, take up in the next class and then move on to, once we finish this, we'll move on to some other topics. Yeah, so if uh, there are any questions, you can ask me at this point. <clears throat> uh, hello, sir. I just uh, wanted to say one thing. Uh, 
uh, that is uh, if you can add a few to phd students uh, to our whatsapp group i mean if they can send you a mail yeah yeah uh, no no everybody has been added except uh, anand so i think everybody else is added to the whatsapp group okay okay thank you yeah and the other question i wanted to ask uh, particularly the msc students is that in the initial parts do the theory uh, do you think there was any part of the algebra that requires discussion or something you had difficulty with anyone no sir everyone is fine okay then uh, if you have a problem you get in touch with devraj whatever i have done was from uh, ash soften morgan's book so if you carefully follow that it should not be a problem if you still have a problem you first uh, talk to devraj okay so we'll um, stop here today if there are no other questions and uh, sir yes yes uh, the, the zoom link is same for every class uh, i usually send a link before the class okay sir thank you sir. but your efforts are so appreciable sir you uh, i think uh, uh, fine sir your class is so fine thank you all right so uh, let's meet on not friday i mean we meet on tuesday okay see you then sir yes um uh, i think uh, uh, one day i think i, I don't remember the day for one my one minute sir i couldn't hear you wednesday evening mm -hmm. uh uh 3:30 to uh, sir is uh, 3 to 4:30 class uh, there is a overlap on uh, advanced statistical mechanics and no, so we don't we don't meet on wednesdays our classes are uh, tuesdays and fridays as of now thank uh, you very much sir. thank uh, you sir. other one is kept for tutorials when uh, they become uh, necessary thank you sir thank you very much